Welcome to the Clinical Education Initiative podcast, Conversations with CEI, where we feature conversations with clinical experts, their experience and insights on current health issues in the areas of HIV, primary care and prevention, sexual health, hepatitis C, and drug user health. Hello, this is Stephen Fine at the University of Rochester. And today I'm here to talk about how I talk to patients or other providers about an exciting new antiretroviral medication from Gilead Sciences called Lenacaprevir or Sunlenka. I don't know about you, but I get a lot of questions about Lenacaprevir in my practice since this drug was approved by the FDA earlier this year in 2023. The reason for all this excitement seems to be that this is a new injectable medication and only needs to be given once every six months. After years oral HIV medications, starting out with multiple pills and handfuls of pills taken multiple times a day, and eventually streamlining to what most people consider now a single tablet regimen just taken once a day, the next big frontier for HIV meds seem to be long-acting injectable formulations. A lot of my patients were very excited when the Vive product, Cabinuva, which is cabrotegravir and rilpivirine, injectable came out onto the market. Because for the first time, patients in a select group were free of having to take a daily pill. Some of them reported relief from the daily reminder that they have HIV, which when they were required to take a daily pill. Some of them felt better because they no longer had to worry about remembering or worry about forgetting to take their medication and others just like the convenience of not having to remember to take pills with them when they traveled. But whatever the reason, a lot of patients truly liked the new freedom in the injectable medication, cabotegravir relpivirine. This combination, of course, didn't work for people who have resistance to one of the agents. It required initially once a month injections, now every two months, And some people developed injection site reactions that were on the painful side. It's only natural that when some of my patients started hearing about a once every six month injectable, and this one could be given subcutaneous instead of intramuscular, that they are already starting to feel some excitement. So in today's podcast, I'm going to talk a little bit about lenacaprevir. What is it? What the indications are currently? The clinical data that led to FDA approval? some new data that came out at this last month's CROI, Conference on Retrovirus and Opportunistic Infection, and how maybe it'll be used in the future both to treat HIV and perhaps even for pre-exposure prophylaxis. First question I often get is, what is it? What is a capsid inhibitor? Lenacaprevir or Sunlenka binds to the capsid protein subunit in HIV and interferes with multiple functions of this capsid subunit. One of the functions of the capsid protein is to help the HIV DNA get into the nucleus so it can integrate. So this inhibitor actually blocks viral entry into the nucleus of the cell. In addition, it blocks virus assembly into new virions, and it blocks the release of the new virions. So it actually works at multiple places along the viral life cycle. Its current indication, as approved by the FDA, is to be injected in combination with other antiretrovirals, which are taken orally usually, in adults that have multidrug-resistant HIV infections. This, of course, is a very important indication, and it's often how new antiretroviral drugs are approved, because the initial studies were done in patients who already had resistance and very few other options. So these multidrug-resistant patients may not have other possible regimens that can be constructed with existing antiretrovirals in order to achieve full viral suppression. Currently, it needs to be given by injection by a healthcare professional instead of by the patient themselves at home. Even though it is a subcutaneous injection, that's how it's approved for now. The clinical data that led to its current approval is the Capella trial. It was a pretty small trial with only 72 patients, all of whom were heavily treatment experienced and were resistant to at least two agents in three of the four classes of antiretrovirals. So the four classes, of course, are nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, 
and integrase inhibitors. So the patients in the trial had to be resistant to at least two agents and at least three out of those four classes. In order to show that lenacaprevir by itself had a potent antiretroviral effect, some of the patients in the Capella trial were randomized to receive either lenacaprevir alone or a placebo for the first 14 days of the trial. After that, all the patients were put on lenacaprevir plus an optimized background regimen of antiretrovirals based on their current resistance pattern. The rest of the patients in the trial skipped the 14-day randomized section and just went on lenacaprevir plus the optimized background. The patients were examined after 14 days for more than 0.5 log drop in viral load. And what they found was 88% in the lenacaprevir group versus only 17% in the placebo group achieved that 0.5 log drop in viral load, thus showing that the lenacaprevir by itself had a significant effect on viral replication. After that, the entire group was followed for 52 weeks. And what they found was after 52 weeks, 83% of this very highly treatment experienced group showed viral suppression with less than 50 copies, basically undetectable viral load. This is considered a really great result for highly treatment experienced patients who really didn't have too many other viral antiretroviral options. In addition, the CD4 cell counts in this group also rose by an average of 80 points. The participants in the trial seemed quite happy with their regimens, and the lenacaprevir was extremely well tolerated, the most common adverse events being injection site reactions that were frequent but relatively not severe. 63% of all participants reported injection site reactions, and the next up was nausea at only 4%. So right now, lenacaprevir remains an exciting option for patients who are highly treatment experienced and have very few other options. If you can devise an optimized background with lenacaprevir with, say, one or two other active agents, you're quite likely to be able to suppress those patients in, with the addition of lenacaprevir. Patients who came into the trial with viral loads over 100,000 also showed really good response as did those with CD4 counts less than 200. Patients with pre-existing integrase inhibitor re resistance did well, and those with only one or two other active agents also did quite well. So patients are coming into the office hearing about this and wondering, can they actually get on a regimen where they only have to take an injection every six months? And unfortunately, I have to disappoint them at least for now. And the reason being lenacaprevir by itself isn't a full suppressive regimen for HIV, and patients are likely to develop resistance, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. There's nothing else really to pair it with that's long-acting at the moment. So that's where the data from this last, most recent CROI, CROI 2023, which was presented in February, comes into play. I often discuss this trial with patients to give them a little bit of hope and excitement for the future. In this trial, which is certainly an early phase trial, Lenacaprevir was combined with broadly neutralizing antibodies against HIV to comprise a regimen that could actually be given just twice a year. It's long been known that patients develop antibodies to HIV, forming the basis of HIV tests, as well as some immunity that helps people in controlling the HIV viral burden. It's been long sought after to find antibodies that are broadly neutralizing meaning they continue to work on all the variations of HIV that are produced in a single person and can continue to work even after the HIV changes and mutates in trying to ev evade the immune system response. Unfortunately, finding antibodies that retain activity against all the different variations of HIV hasn't yet been possible. However, there are a few known broadly neutralizing antibodies that cover a broad range of HIV strains and that may work in some cases. The advantage to these antibodies is that, although given intravenously, they can be given fairly infrequently. From now on in this podcast, I'm going to refer to broadly neutralizing antibodies as BNABs. They have names like Terapavimab and Zimlirvimab, but for obvious reasons, I won't refer to them by names in the future. The CROI studies presented patients who were already suppressed, so their viral loads were already undetectable. However, 
They also had to have CD4 counts over 500, and they had special proviral DNA sequencing to prove that they would, in fact, be sensitive to the BNABs. In the study, they were given lenacaprevir by subcutaneous injection and the BNABs through intravenous infusion, and the patients were followed for 26 weeks. At week 26, 18 out of the initial 20 patients were still virally suppressed at less than 50 copies. That's 90%. One of the patients actually withdrew from the study who was already suppressed, so there was actually only one patient who had viral rebound during the study, and that occurred at week 16. That patient went back on their old regimen and were readily suppressed once again, so it didn't seem to be harmful. It's only a small study with 20 patients, but it was exciting that patients with only one every six-month treatment uh, had remained suppressed for 26 weeks. BNABs are only one possibility of something that lenacaprevir could be paired with for long-acting suppression of HIV. Even though studies were halted for a while, there are still ongoing studies with other antiretrovirals such as islatrovir that could potentially be formulated for in a long-acting form. Unfortunately, right now it's too early to tell what the next step's going to be. Perhaps some of the most exciting news with lenacaprevir may eventually come out of the clinical trials that are ongoing right now for pre-exposure prophylaxis. One of the biggest issues with pre-exposure prophylaxis is that it only works if patients take it. For a long time, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV was limited to pills, which certainly pose a problem with adherence. And more recently, cabotegavir injection for long-acting protection is a great step forward, but still has the issues that patients need to come frequently in for intramuscular injection. So far, the data for lenacaprevir for long-acting protection against HIV looks very promising in the animal studies, and there are several studies enrolling for exposure prophylaxis, including for people who have sex with men and are at high risk for acquiring HIV, and I'd certainly urge any listeners who have patients interested in looking at pre-exposure prophylaxis studies to look for those going on with lenacaprevir. One question I often get is resistance. And it turns out, like all of the other antiretrovirals looked at so far, HIV can become resistant to lenacaprevir. There are several capsid mutations specifically known that give resistance to lenacaprevir. But luckily, so far, these capsid resistance isolates don't seem to be cross-resistant to some of the other entry inhibitors like fostemzivir, ibiluzumab, and maraviroc. There's no data on the safety of lenacaprevir in pregnancy, although the initial studies in animals didn't show any harm. Current tips for using lenacaprevir include careful selection of patients who are going to adhere to the schedule and come in at least every six months for their injection and continue to adhere to the other medications in the optimized background regimen. The injections themselves require, so far, two injections in the abdomen at separate sites. It's interesting that they recommend starting out with oral doses, and there are two oral doses given on day one and day two, and then a third oral dose given on day eight. Then the subcutaneous injections start on day 15, and after that, it's once every 26 weeks, plus or minus two weeks. It's recommended that if a patient shows up having gone longer than 28 weeks after their initial injection, that they start the oral lead-in phase again. No dose adjustments recommended for elderly patients. For those with renal impairment, there's no dose adjustment. And those with mild to moderate liver disease, there's no dose adjustment. For more severe liver disease, like child pew class C, there really isn't any data, hasn't been studied, so it's recommended that lenacaprevir would be used with caution. Although some people tend to not consider drug-drug interactions with injectable medications, there are actually a number of drug-drug interactions to be considered. For example, the level of lenacaprevir might be significantly reduced by strong inducers of CYP3A, PGP, and UGT1A1 enzymes. So it can't be used with rifampin, carbamazepine, phenytoin, or St. John's wort. Some of the more moderate inducers of these enzymes, such as efavirenz, are also not recommended, and the level of lenacaprevir may be increased by some of the inhibitors, such as adazanavir, cobacistat. A fairly comprehensive listing of drug-drug interactions 
including lenacapravir, can be found on hivguidelines.org. So in summary, I think it's important to tell patients that this long-acting antiretroviral has a lot of exciting possibilities. Right now, it's really only indicated for patients who have multidrug-resistant HIV and limited treatment options in combination with an optimized background regimen. However, in the future, we may be able to combine it with other long-acting agents and be free of pills entirely for up to six months at a time. It's been really well tolerated in clinical trials, and the patients so far seem to have a high level of satisfaction. One of the most exciting possibilities is for pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. I always caution patients that we can't use it alone, and it's certainly not a cure for HIV infection. Hopefully, the ongoing research will continue to yield positive results and other new agents to pair this with, and we may have a new set of options for our patients who continue to struggle with their adherence to pills. Thank you for tuning in. Join us next time for a new episode of Conversations with CEI. Visit us at ceitraining.org and follow us on CEI social media platforms.